This episode is sponsored by Be Water Smart, bewatersmart.info. Drought and water conservation is a way of life in the West, but saving water should always be a good garden practice wherever you live. Be Water Smart is making it their goal to help gardeners, homeowners, and residents do their part with helpful tips, videos, and links. You will find tips on irrigation, such as when you should water, which type of drip or sprinklers are best, and even a very helpful video on how to convert standard sprinklers to drip. Plus, what I always preach about, mulching. Remember, no pixie dust. And you'll even find a video of me talking about it. And of course, you've heard me say over and over again, check your soil moisture before you water. Why waste water when not necessary? Be Water Smart has helpful tips so you know you are watering efficiently and correctly. This includes how to water trees and even save 30% more on lawn irrigation. Plus, they have a database of 1,800 low-water-use plants. Yes, 1,800 plants. Plus, garden tours and pictures to help you design and plant your water-wise landscaping. And since watering smart saves not only our precious resource, but helps you save money, they have links for rebates and services. So stay current on Be Water Smart News by signing up so you don't miss important info. That's BeWaterSmart.info. Look at that plant. I want you to know that everything was grown in my garden. Don't touch that plant! Is it poisonous? She'll become part of the plant. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Flower Power Garden Hour. I am your host, Marlene, and this is a question and answer episode. So joining me, of course, is Joe. Joe, say hello. Hello. All right. Um, Great. That was a nice, friendly hello. Feels like we haven't done one of these in a very long time. Um, no, I don't think I it's think been we that did long. One, yeah, I think we did one last month. We definitely did one last yeah, month. Yeah, just feels like it's been longer. I feel like I get questioned by you daily. And I feel like I have answers for you every time. Correct answers, right answers, ones you should follow. So anyways, let's see what's been going on. Um, this weekend, I am traveling down to San Diego with Jean-Luca, who was my guest on the most recent uh one of the most recent ones. I didn't realize that was this uh, weekend. Yeah, it's coming this weekend. <laughs> yeah, we are hitting the road going down to San Diego and he has it lined up where we are meeting a whole bunch of his uh, succulent grower friends visiting some nurseries and we are uh, succulent shopping. We are going to be just two plant nerds on the road. And the cats and I have the entire compound to ourselves. You guys are going to just party it up with catnip and stuff. Don't do too much catnip. No, no. Yeah. Chicken, beef, maybe even some bison Ooh, for beetle goat. Wow. I beetle know. goat loves her bison. Yes. Um, let's see what else has been going on. Um, trying to remember what's been going on. See, the recorder's holiday. wrapping up. Holiday. Yeah, there's a holiday. There was. Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Yep. Yep. Um, we had it um, out. Uh, it was, as usual, we have a non-traditional ones and I know people say that but how many people pull out a um Victorian couch out of their barn and just stick it between the barns and sit there I mean a lot of people don't have barns and but anyways we had a couch outside and we just sort of sat around and uh, we did not have Thanksgiving uh turkey we had tri-tip and your parents brought my favorite food if the egg rolls from King egg roll that's my if I was stranded on an island what food would I want? And it would definitely be King Egg Rolls. Egg Rolls from King Egg Roll in San Jose. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. So. Uh, we took our niece on a bunch of different rides in different vehicles. That's not our, our goddaughter. Whatever. Yeah. Isn't that what it's called? <laughs> no, niece is when it's a, a blood relative. I mean, she calls you Uncle Joe. Yeah. Yeah. So then what? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, is it tougher? Uh, uh, tougher? Her, is that a sibling of yours? No, no, but you, they say, <laughs> I think the norm is aunt, uncle. Yeah, but then generally, like, that's just what, like, kids call as a, a term of endearment. But when we're talking, we just say goddaughter. Oh, my God, whatever. Whatever, okay. <laughs> hey, I have enough nieces and nephews. Well, I have to buy her presents anyway, so it doesn't matter. I was going to say, I have enough I have to shop for. So, yeah, uh, we took her well, around if you're on... disowning our fake niece, apparently, <laughs> glad you did it on air. <laughs> No, You're that a was great not sort of, That was sort of rude of me. I'm like, ah, oh, God, she's not our niece. Oh. <laughs> hey. 
Hey, I, I wish she was. I'm actually taking. Um, this is just backtracking. This is really. No, no, because it gets worse. I'm I'm taking uh, dibs. It's like I'm starting to like, get the kids really good presents with them knowing it's from me because, you know, when we're older, we're going to need to be taken care of. So basically, it's my care is going to the highest bidder. And I'm fine with that. You stated that completely wrong. Your care is going to the highest bidder. You are the bidder. Oh, well, I it. am the bidder. <laughs> Anyways, okay, let's uh, let's continue. I'm trying to think of any. I really can't remember anything. Let's just answer some questions, and I'll think of things as there had to be other stuff. Yeah, what but else? I can't remember. You've been doing a lot of uh, cleanup prep work. I feel like around the yard, gardens. Yeah, that's just well, actually no. I feel like I haven't needed people to see pictures, and they're like, "Wow, that's so much work." No, I mean this time last year we were planning the raised beds we hadn't started them there's a lot of prep work but i told you i said once things are getting going you've been outside a lot doing stuff yeah there's always stuff to do and i, and I enjoy it i don't have to okay. so weed control oh, there's, there's like always, a lot of weed control oh there's lately. always yeah there's always weed control though i don't enjoy that yeah if if you know if there was no if there were no weeds then there'd be a lot less stuff to do in the garden you have some of your winter greens coming in because mm -hmm. you told me last week you're going to show me what I can pick and use. Yes. Okay. Yes. Haven't done that yet. No, I haven't. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the broccoli's coming in. It's trying to bolt a little bit. And bolting means it just, you know, broccoli when you eat it, it's the flower head. And it could quickly form some florets and then go to flower. But mine got to a decent size and I've been cutting it. But definitely we've had, you know, it was sunnier and warmer for a while, and that was just causing them to bolt, but um, harvested them right before. And I, I mean, the thing I like about broccoli, too, is you cut the main head off and all these little side florets come off. You could eat the stems. You could eat the leaves. That's why I prefer it. You know, I always say, oh, poor cauliflower. You know, you just get one big head and that's it. Uh, cabbage, that's it. So what I always feel like broccoli gives you so much more that's why i plant a decent amount and of course you know kale and harvesting some radishes forgot what radishes i pulled up the other day it wasn't until i pulled them up and saw what they were i was like oh, i'm the most unorganized gardener i have nothing labeled i always think i'm going to remember what i plant nope i know joe yep all right i'm sure i'll remember more so let's just start answering some questions and then then i'll go off on some tangents about things i remember fine okay water was going to be one i was going to bring up Hmm. Like it seems to be the lack thereof. Yeah, scary. Yeah, we we had big it's, rain early yeah. in the year, mm -hmm. right? Early yeah, we, in the winter, we literally had one day of six inches, and that was right. It. Yep. We're supposed to get a a smattering of rain tomorrow. I heard a rumor about a snowstorm coming. Yeah, I mean, we rely. It was just on a bad text chain, potentially from unreliable people. So I don't know if that was true. No. Oh. Well, I heard that maybe six to eight inches in this. In uh, you were on the snow. same text chain, probably. So. Or that was a local news. Yeah. So, and well, then we're supposed to get normal. potentially more rain Thursday, but we we need it consistent. Yes, consistent. But I mean, I still have a theory that our winter is pushed back and our rainy season is more towards March and April. Let's see if that. But I would like it to get a little bit early because uh, the scary thing is if we don't get a lot of rain. I may not be planting a vegetable garden. Simple as that. I know you shake your head. Hey. You've been through, I swear, every year there's a, this is my last garden for no, one reason or another. Remember when we had the severe drought several years and I let my garden go at the last house? Yeah, but that's because you got tired of – it like got overgrown and you were like, I'm out. No, because it was more so that I know our neighbors by us, their wells were running dry and you could see everything. You could see who was irrigating from the street and I didn't want to be <laughs> – I didn't want nasty notes lost on <laughs> – but anyways, okay, let's go. It's a cactus question. Okay. Not sure – this is from Susan. Okay. And she doesn't know if – there's a methodology to removing new growth on her cactus or if she even can. Okay. Um, what kind of cactus is this? Is there a picture? Do you know? There was a, pic a picture. It was a, um, I think it was an Echinopsis pachanoi, I believe. What's but that? it was, it's, What's it's it a tall like? linear cactus. Okay. That actually wasn't a cactus. It was, uh, no, Echinopsis. Yes, it was cactus. But, um, so when she says cactus, this goes for along other succulents. Um, that look like cacti, you know, like the euphorbias and stuff. So, yeah, so you have a really thick um, 
growing cacti, side shoots come off. You either you don't want them on there because you want to pull them off and start new plants or you're afraid they're going to break off or they're it's just too wide and you, you know, they're pretty linear. So once they start branching off, you know, they're going to take up more space. So there's various reasons why you want to remove them. And it's pretty simple to do. I don't recommend doing it this time of year. I recommend doing it when they are actively growing, which is in spring. If they're inside, that, that's different because you're sort of, you know, mimicking um, outside or, you know, different conditions. But what we do, of course, because they have spines, is take some leather gloves. If they're really spiny, take leather, thick leather gloves, take pieces of foam, um, not foam um, like styrofoam, but foam that's flexible and wrap it around because that's going to sort of help protect you from the spines. And then tongs, long tongs to hold the piece and simply twist the piece off. That is going to be the easiest mode of getting sections to come off completely. We're talking about whole branching sections. If you, they don't have lots of spines on them, you could simply grab them and just sort of twist them off and it makes a nice clean break off of the mother plant. And that's what you're trying to do is prevent as much damage and open wounds on the mother plant as possible. So once you've done that, you're going to take that piece and you're going to place it upright in a pot with no soil or anything um, where it could stay upright out of direct sun, out of freezing cold, and let that wound at the base where you've just twisted it off heal and callus until it's firm. And that could be as much as, you know, a week to, you know, several months. Um, but if you twist it off, you're also preventing a bigger wound. So if you were to, you know, cut half of the section um, right into that piece, you're creating a large wound and that's going to take a really long time to callus over. So, and then from there, once it's calloused over, then you could plant it up in direct pumice or a very loose succulent mix. So no, you don't need to remove it. Yes, you can. And the best way is simply to twist it off however way. If you can't twist it off, take a straight blade, not, not serrated because you don't want to create jagged um, cuts. Take a straight blade, really sharp, and then just simply, you know, slice it off the closest you can um, to the piece and to the the mother mother plant. And that's it. Okay, and I think I've asked you before, nothing that you put on the open wound? No. No. If, if when in doubt you can dust a little sulfur dust. It's it's a natural fungicide. Okay. Yeah. That's it. But you wouldn't do it proactively as a preventative. No, I wouldn't, especially since you're going to want to be doing this when there's no like I wouldn't do it on a really foggy day. I wouldn't do it on with rain coming. You want it to be sort of a sunny, dry day so no excess moisture gets in there. So is it best to wait till spring, summer? That's what I was saying. Um, spring, dry okay. time in spring. Got it. I mean, it's not necessary. It's just for the plants uh, to heal. That's when they're doing more active growth and they're going to heal quicker. Okay. I think that's good enough. All right. Last year after Christmas, I put my two poinsettias out on the front deck and watered them. They lived all year long. I moved them to a place where we do not turn the lights on and it stays dark in hopes that they turn red. Is there a nutrient that I can give them to help them enhance their redness? Okay. So this actually was my uh, segment that I did on Good Day Sacramento today about okay. poinsettia care. First question. Yes. The whole darkness thing. Yes. That's real? Yes. Oh, okay. yes. Why? A day length. Yeah, but why does it make them red? Red versus what? Um, green. Red versus green. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. if they're in, is it is it a certain amount of daylight? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. It's it's the the day length. Yes. So, okay. So you say you get. I'm gonna go through just buying a whole poinsettia. You buy a poinsettia. They're everywhere except for because I was buying some for the good day segment. A couple of years ago, I remember seeing some of the most beautiful, i.e. gaudy poinsettias, you know, pink splashes and almost purple maroon bracts and pink swirls, all these beautiful colors. It was almost like obscene. I went to go look for some like that. And the most uh, crazy one I saw was just a red with white splashes. So I think what happened is last year was covid 
no one was really decorating or celebrating maybe. So the growers anticipated for this year, hey, let's just pump out some, you know, reds and whites and a little bit of pinks and let's not go crazy. That's maybe what happened. I'm hoping next year there's a lot more crazy ones. So anyways, so you go to the store, you buy one. You know, it's in that gold sleeve. When you water, make sure you remove that sleeve so there's not standing water in it. It's going to be in a peat, heavy peat soil, which holds a lot of water. So you're probably not going to have to water it very often. You don't want to overwater it because it will rot. Now, a lot of times you'll get one, you'll bring it home, and all of a sudden it'll start dropping leaves. That's because you're just changing it. It's been moved around a lot. Went from pristine greenhouse conditions to, a, you know, a, a truck to the grocery store the nursery, and then to your house. So all that changes of temperature and humidity could cause leaves to drop. So just keep it in, you know, a nice bright spot. Um, you know, keep it on your your table if there's, you know, a, if it's bright. And then, like I said, water it only when like it's really light. You could lift it up and if it's like, woo, that's really light. So um, and the top several inches are dry. Now, remember, peat's really hard to rewet when it gets dry. So you don't want to get it bone dry because then you're going to have to really soak that root ball to rehydrate it. But, you know, it's it, keep it away from heater vents in the fireplace too. But as it ages and as the season goes, we turn, you know, into January, it's going to get leggier and leggier. What I mean by that is it's not going to be that nice, short, compact bush that you got um, because in the wild, Believe it or not, they could be pretty tall shrubs. They're native to Mexico and they grow as perennials, but they don't grow as perennials here because once you're done with the holidays, yes, this she moved it outside because it can handle it, but it can't handle temperatures like below 50. It doesn't like temperatures below 50. So if you have it outside and it's 50 or below, it, it could die. That's how sensitive it, it is. So you could bring it in. Now, if you want it to, so by the time you move it outside, if you have it year round, it's just going to grow and it's going to be green. So how do you get it red or whatever color? You cut it down, like down to like six inches or so, six to eight inches or so. Then it has to be in complete darkness for 12 to 14 hours, eight weeks before you want it to be in pristine color. So count back, you know, for Christmas, if you have people over and you want it to look perfect, count back eight weeks and you need to have keep it in the dark. And I mean dark as in not not uh, street lights, not your uh, porch light. It has to be really, really dark. So that's even going to inhibit the color change on that. And so about eight weeks of 12 to 14 hours of complete darkness. The rest of the time, you know, it does want light. And then that should color it up. And it, since you cut it back, it should then be bushier to bring inside. You ready for questions? Uh, yeah. Okay. Do you know what the actual red coloring is coming from? Well, it's an anthocyanin pigment. Okay. Um, Why does that come about via darkness? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, most likely, okay, so what you're looking at are leaves, and they're not petals. They're okay. actually modified leaves called bracts. Got it. The flowers are very small, and they're in the center of that when they leaf up. So basically... When the flower changes into um, red bracts, it's also flowering at the same time. So, of course, that's going to act as an attractant. So, basically, it's a pollination mechanism. So, instead of having petals do the attractive pollination mm. part, it's using these big giant bracts. And, and why is it day length that changes it? It's just production of it, probably. I don't know all the hormones that go into it. Where are they from? Uh, Mexico, but I'm, uh, it's obviously pretty warm, warm tropical ish areas since it can't handle temperatures below 50. Hmm. Yeah. You said it takes how many cumulative hours of darkness? I don't know. Do the math for me. Eight weeks of 12 to 14 hours a night. Wow. In Mexico. Yeah. That seems like a lot because you don't get because it's so it's closer to medial, the, you know, via the equator relatively, yeah, right? Yeah, Southern yeah. Mexico, Mexico is pretty long. Um, think about where I mean, think about how many day hours of day length are we darkness are we getting? Yeah, we're, I mean, we're not that far. Yeah, I don't off. think they're that far, s f much further. S I mean, further south, but really, you think? Why don't you, while I'm answering the next question, look it up exactly? Okay. Yeah. All right. Why don't you do some research, Joe? 
All right. And nice. well, I was going to say an interesting thing though that I was reading is that to get all the crosses and to get like a pure pure white one because you see a lot of like the beige ones, but the pure pure white um, was actually someone found um, a good idea was to take a uh, cornastra is the other species of euphorbia because they're euphorbias. And that's another thing I want to mention is if you have cats, don't put them in your house. If you have kids who like to eat plants, don't put them in your house. They're not the most toxic, but they're definitely toxic as far as eating it. And cats will get sick. Dogs will get sick and throw up. And then I hear stories. They're like, oh, my cat ate a whole bunch of leaves and didn't get sick. Don't don't risk it. It is euphorbia. You want to avoid getting that sap in your eye. Um, so definitely you know, just be cautious of having it inside. But anyways, they, they're they doing hybrids of this euphorbia and the cornastor, which is the pure white one, which is pretty rare. And that's how they're getting like the pure white one. And then they're just for all the crazy different color strains, they're doing a lot of just selective, selective growth, crossing things and, you know, um, selecting out for those maroons and the pinks and everything. So. All right. So you're going to look up to see where it's at ne ne uh, exactly in Mexico? Yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks, Joe. Now, about that euphorbia salad that you made me last night. Um, That was good for you. It was really good for you. How are you feeling, Joe? Feeling good? I'm a little feeling tired. Good? Joe, can I have you sign this this paper right here? Right here? Just, just ignore where it says life insurance payout. My plumeria outside. I had my plumeria outside all spring and summer. Seems really hardy now. I move it into the sun during the day and night. I move it by the house and put a plant cover on it. Should I leave it outside or bring it into the garage or house now that the temperatures are dropping? Okay. Remember, Joe, we did a really good episode on Plumeria. And it was the first one we did remote. And the yeah. sound was horrible. Yeah. And you're like, oh, I'm going to edit. But we think we're just going to re-record it with the two people. I've Chandler. been working on editing that one for about a year and a half. Okay, yeah. Yeah. How far along are you on that? I'm about 79 hours in. <laughs> no, but on the podcast, that's you're 79 hours in, but five minutes into the podcast, right? More like eight and a half minutes. Okay, great. Yeah, so it's probably just easier we re-record. It'll be the same people, same information. But yeah, I, I wanted to put that one out quite a while because we do get plumerian questions. Hi, Jill. Hi, Chandler's mom. <laughs> Okay. Anyways. All right. So plumerias. Oh, wait a minute. She's going to be listening to this. So, Ooh, I better get this right. Um, I always, I always say I'm not, you know, an expert at, by far with plumerias. I've grown them. I've killed them. We have them at work. Um, I love them. Um, there's one called uh, Jungle Jacks. It's a nursery down in Vista and you go online and it's, it's just like eye candy. Oh, so many gorgeous plumerias. And that you can't even smell and the fragrance is something that's just fabulous about them. So we have some at work and they're not in the greenhouse. They're between our greenhouses tucked amongst other plants in pots. So they survive the winter just fine because it's pretty warm with the, the greenhouses and the plants. So if you have an area that's really covered with plants up against a house, yes, they could grow outside. But when in doubt, yes, bring them in. Um, generally, you know, they can become tree sizes, but generally that's not what we see in areas where it gets cold. So if it's in a pot, bring it inside. It will drop its leaves inside. That's completely normal. Don't worry about that. Of course, when a plant drops its leaves and it's dormant, you want to cut the water back greatly, greatly. And, you know, by the time the sun and temperatures warm up, you move it outside and it'll put on uh, leaves. So inside, keep it by a bright window. Yes, you could put it in a garage, but make sure your garage isn't as cold as, I mean, garages still could be pretty darn cold. And the risk for the garage is there's not a window, so it's not getting light. Yes, it's not actively growing, but you don't want it to be in a pitch dark garage all the time. So if you have a window in your garage, great. I mean, if that's the, the only spot you could put it, for sure. You know, two months of being more dark um, is better than it freezing outside. A covering, yes, you could cover it up against the house. Um, you know, but really, they don't want to be in temperatures 40 below. They'll literally could freeze at 32. They're full of water. They're pretty much a succulent. I, I consider them succulent sometimes. Um, so yeah, that's um, 
So she's moving it into the sun and then moving it up close to the house. I won't even do that. If it's close to your house, um, this time of year, they're not doing much active growth. So it's still bright. It's still getting enough light. It's the cold and I wouldn't bother about moving it back. If you're covering it, um, that's okay. But if we get a heavy frost, I would just bring it inside. Yeah. All right. That's it. You good? Yeah. Okay. I mean, I'll know if Jill lets me know if I got it all wrong. So do the after. covering it does nothing for it? No, no, no. Covering does. Um, it's just they're really not happy with temperatures 40 and below. And we're get, we're having a lot of those. So if you're in an area of 40 below, um, you know, it's it's 32, they're they're pretty much frozen. 40, they're they're not happy. So that's why I mean we're, you know, it's rare we get 32 high 20s, but a lot of people and us 40s common. But like I said, we have them growing at the conservatory and they're really tucked in and happy. But you know, those temperatures are probably good eight degrees warmer than oh at least at aren't least. they o- outside between the greenhouses tucked in oh oh yeah well, not they're talking about in the greenhouse. oh yeah 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 we better be a lot warmer than yeah. that inside yeah yeah i'm sure even mm-hmm. between the mm-hmm. greenhouse they're probably warmer yeah significantly okay my fuyu persimmon tree always gave good fruit in the past this year almost all the fruit has three to four seeds in them i don't know if that's good or bad uh, my friend also has the same persimmon tree. Every year he gets persimmons with hardly any seeds in his fruit. What could be the cause of all the seeds showing up in one year and not another? This is from a Liberato. Oh, um, people love their persimmons. It's hit or miss. What, what kind of, so fuyu persimmon, what kind of persimmon is that? That is the, the shorter. The flat one? Yeah, the flatter one. The haichia is the more heart-shaped, softer one. The big one? Yeah, the bigger one. Okay. Yeah. And I really, I don't know much about persimmons because I'm not a big fan. They're beautiful in the fall with all the fruit hanging on them, but some people just go crazy. Your dad is like the dehydrating master of persimmons. Persimmons. Yeah. That's the only way I like them. Yeah. A lot of people prefer them. I mean, a lot of people prefer dried fruit. Just, yeah. But yeah, some people like uh, go crazy. I mean, I'm not saying they're not bad. It's just, I'm not, they're not my favorite. Our uh, neighbors. Have them across have the neighbors? way by the ish. <laughs> okay. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. She asked me the other day if we want some of the, the flat persimmons. Yeah. I'll try drying some. That's what I said. I yeah. said, yep, we'll mm-hmm. dry them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, mean, I do eat them. It's just not some people are just crazy. I don't know if I've ever had a, a, un, a hydrated persimmon. So the uh, fuyus, when they're dry, when off of the plant, are like the consistency of an apple. Yeah, I know that. Oh, excuse me. The hychias are like a soft plum. I'm pretty sure I'm getting this right. I'm sure there's people out there like, no, it's the other way around. But no, I'm pretty sure it's okay. All right. So you talk about what's it called again? The big one? Hychia. Hychia. Okay. So there's one source for that if you want to learn about those, I believe. Is that Hugh Hauser? Yes. yes. <laughs> it's the very famous Hugh Hauser yeah. episode. Mm-hmm, where of... he goes and they, they, de- they dry them in full... S- Size, full size, and like a draw, like a smokehouse almost. I thought they just hung on my. That's what I mean. It just looks like yeah. that. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. But in terms yeah. of visually, crazy. what it looks like crazy. Well, and that's that... the old. Um, is a Japanese way yeah. of doing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That yeah. that farm that they were doing it on was right up in what's the. Um... I want to say Loomis, but no. no, 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 not even that far in the foothills. Newcastle. Uh, not even that far in the foothills. I don't know. Granite Bay. Oh wow! Okay. Yep, that's okay. where it was. Okay. Um, okay. So yeah, you, you obviously you don't want seeds because it's easy, you know, eating it. You don't want to have to deal with seeds, cutting it up and dehydrating. You don't have to deal with seeds. And they're pretty big seeds if I remember correctly. Um, so why is this going on? Well, interesting thing is that they are either male or female plants. Of course, the female is going to produce fruit. And you don't necessarily need to because they do this weird thing called parthenocarpy, where they literally could form fruit without being pollinated. Pretty amazing. I see. I wowed you with that. Um, That's why you get seedless citrus sometimes is same same way. They swell up and without seeds. And every once in a while you get one with seeds and you're like, wow, why did this have seeds in it? It's because it's literally without pollination it's swelling up. But 
it can be pollinated by pollen by another one, and that's when you get seeds. So what's happening most likely is here you have your female one, probably somewhere there is a male that happened to be blooming at the same time as this one. Bees move the pollen, and then the flowers were pollinated by the bees, and then the flower or the fruit formed with seeds because it was truly pollinated. And when it's pollinated, it's actually a different, it can actually taste different because you're getting different genetics, basically. Um, so yeah, that's interesting. So probably the other times is the, the timing of the trees blooming weren't the same. So you had the female just forming fruit on its own without being pollinated. And then you just happen every once in a while, randomly have the male nearby blooming at the same time and the pollen gets moved by the bees. So I believe that is what's happening. Interesting. What's the name of those again? Of the Haichiu? Haichia? Okay. What's a ho Hoshigaki? I don't know. Hmm. Those are the big ones that were like hanging. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Did you look up Hulhauser? I did. Oto Orchard. Okay. In Granite Bay. O-T-O-W. Is it still there? O-T-O-W. still there. Yeah. Wow. Uh, very challenging Hoshigaki season. Oh, this As year? of November 20th. Yeah. Oh, really? The early ones dried really well, but they're very small. Many peeled after the heavy rains and dropped off their calyx. Okay. Yeah, that's the yeah. basically the little area around the, yeah. the fruit. Yeah, and they can't find anybody to work there. Uh, well, that's mm -hmm. hmm. Joe, why don't you go on your spare time? Hmm. Yeah, we have to have them on my podcast. You should. They'd be really interesting because that was an interesting one. Yeah. Um, and it was episode one zero zero one one of California's Gold. Yes. Highly recommended. Yes. <laughs> it's a top. It's a Heel classic. Probably a top three. It's a Heel classic. Heel I mean, episode. come on. I mean, I don't know if anything could be it's an avocado eaten dog. This, but this is close. This is a pretty good one. It's a good There's one. some Heelisms in there. But yeah, but it was also just really interesting um, to see. Hey, oh, yeah. Yeah. if I remember they're in Granite Bay after like seven That's amazing. years between I know, it, I know. It's stuck. Yeah, you can't remember my birthday. No. No. Okay. Um, there's one more question. Oh, this is your, one of your pain points. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. This lady needs help. She got a bereavement plant. She waters it once a week. And I got to say, it doesn't sound like it's a bereavement plant. It sounds like it's a bereavement bouquet. Mm -hmm. uh, she says, it has so many different plants in it. How do I keep all the plants happy? Yes. You know, it's one of my pain points because the stress people feel to keep a plant alive that has any uh, relation to a loved one passing, it's it's stressful. Versus if you were to just get a bouquet, you expect it to die and then you throw it away. But these plants symbolize a lot and people really want to keep them alive. So I always feel bad. And I, I know the florist nursery hates me when I say, well, maybe they don't. We'll just buy cut flowers. Same thing. But yeah, this is one of those, you know, you have three plants in a basket. It's a good idea. I'm giving someone a plant so it won't die. That I mean, the 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 sentiment is there. But then you get people who are like, how do I take care of this? I'm stressed. Um, so yes, anytime you have three plants in one pot, they're going to want to be in their own pot. So I saw this picture in the pots they were in really, really short just because the basket was short. So separate them out as best as you can. Basically take them out of the container, pull them apart. You're going to disturb roots. That's okay. Make sure they're watered in before you do that so they're they're not dehydrated. And then you're going to put them in their own pot. And of course, the pot's going to have to have holes. And the pot should only be slightly bigger than the existing root ball. So you should sort of get an idea of just by looking at the plant. So just a little bit bigger. Most likely, it's in heavy peat soil because that's what most potted plants come in for transport. You're going to want to add something that has a little bit better drainage. So like a succulent mix. And then just pot them up. And then, of course, water them in after you pot. So I just happened to see the pictures of this one. She had a um, a peace lily. So peace lilies are great house plants. Low light, high light. Um, 
they may go through a period of adjustment when you transplant them, i.e. all the leaf sort of drooping. Don't worry as long as the soil is moist and you got the root ball in there, it's okay. All the existing foliage may die, but it's the center. You want to see new growth coming out the center. So don't keep watering it. Don't fertilize it. Keep it by a bright area. And then the other one was an epiprenum, which is commonly called pothos. Um, same thing. You know, just try to get as much roots. Don't overwater it. Give it time to adjust. And then the last one was a bromeliad. And fortunately, you know, bromeliads are monocarpic. Once the mother plant blooms, it's going to die. And ideally, it'll have like side pups coming off and that'll keep the plant growing. Um, or it'll basically be a new plant. So this one actually didn't look like it was close to flowering. So she might be able to get it to last longer. Those like to be in a loose soil, more like a bark um, but she could add, you know, um, put it in a succulent mix, just keep it way more on the drier side, like really dry. Um, so those are three plants, but yeah, anytime you get one of those baskets, enjoy it for a bit, but they are going to want to be in their own, uh, container their own because you don't want them competing for root space. Generally one will go, you know, take over and take all the nutrients. Um, and then also some of times they have different growing conditions, just like the bromelia has a different growing condition than the other one. So yeah, don't stress, just, you know, enjoy them. Yeah, that's it. Okay. All that's right. Uh, did you look up uh, the poinsettia? No, I got stuck on persimmons. Oh, Joe. I know. Okay. Well, if, while you're looking it you up. you yammer for a minute. I, I I'm, uh, you know me, you know me. Um, so I was going to tell everyone if they like this podcast to rate and review it. Let's get some good iTunes reviews. Apparently that's how people find you. Um, tell a friend and follow me on Instagram and Facebook, Marlene, the plant lady. And on YouTube, I just changed my name of my YouTube. So it's everything gardening with Marlene Simon. But if you already follow me, you don't need to do anything. Just note the name change. But if you don't follow me, I'm starting to put more videos out. I haven't yet, but I recorded three today. So I'll be uh, editing those and putting those out. That's sort of like a, a goal of mine is to do more uh, YouTube stuff. And if you have any questions, of course, you could ask me at Marlene, the plant lady at gmail.com. And if you have any comments about this, um, suggestions, if you have a uh, guest or an idea for a uh, topic episode, let me know because, of course, I'm always looking. I have some good guests lined up. Um, yeah, some actually some interesting ones. We're going to uh, later this month. Um, these haven't been recorded yet, so knock on wood, but I'm going to talk to um, someone about the history of holiday plants. Um, then in, I think, January or February, I'm going to talk to someone, an expert from the Forest Service about a uh, soil scientist about biochar, which is really interesting because that's one where you hear a lot of misinformation out there. Uh, some people like, oh, biochar, it's just this, you know, this happening, you know, hit word. But no, it's an actual thing and I want to learn all about it. So those are a few episodes that I have coming up and hopefully we'll also record a new plumeria one. Um, all right, Joe, I... I said everything I needed to say. Yeah, it's southern Mexico. So it's about halfway between is where they're native from. Okay. Okay. And it's about halfway between the Tropic of Cancer and the equator. Okay. It's pretty medium. Light. Yeah. I mean, that's about as like as central as you can get for kind of an equidistant so, daylight. Yeah. The only thing I think of is they don't get that dark. They're probably changing slight color. And then possibly we're tweaking it by the longer right. the day length okay. is we're forcing. That's pretty much what I'm going to Yeah, that's go possible. With. I yeah, I that. mean, it, you know, they, they grow with leggy big shrubs. When you get them, they're short, compact, and they're probably not that dark. So there's probably some slight leaf change Yep. Um, to help them, you know, aid in pollination. But, you know, like anything, we sort of just take everything to the max when it comes to, you know, selling plants and growing plants. So that's it. Thanks. Thanks for your research, Joe. Thanks for that. And enjoy that euphorbia salad. Actually, we better not say that. Someone's just going to hear that part. Oh, euphorbia salad. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, everyone. Until next time, happy gardening. <laughs>